Hello and greetings from Durham. My name is Hank Woods. I'm the Associate Dean for Development and Alumni Relations here at the Fuqua School of Business. We'd like to welcome you to Fuqua's Virtual Reunion Week celebration. This week, we're excited to celebrate alumni from this year's and last year's reunion classes whose experience has been disrupted by the pandemic. We'd also like to thank the re many reunion volunteers that hosted virtual class celebrations earlier this spring with over 700 people in attendance. Reunion week programming, which we're now kicking off, includes 20 events over the next four days with more than 1,000 people expected to attend. Special thanks to Oris Stewart, Fuqua Daytime MBA class of 1989 and Chief People and Inclusion Officer of the MBA for his help in inviting our featured speaker to be a part of our reunion lineup this year. It is now my distinct privilege to introduce Dean Bill Balding and Mark Cuban. Mr. Cuban's incredible accomplishments would literally take the entire session to list, but to say he's had a distinguished business career from the time he was a teenager would be a dramatic understatement. You no doubt know him through his role on Shark Tank and as owner of the Dallas Mavericks, but I suspect we'll cover a bit more ground than that during today's session. I'm gonna turn it over to Bill and Mark, and Mark, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Thanks for, ha thanks for having me. Okay, well, thank you so much, Hank, uh, and many, many, many thanks to you, Mark, for, for joining us today. And uh, I, I think that, that Hank left out a whole bunch of stuff in terms of uh, what, what you've done and what you're doing. And let me start with something he didn't mention, which is you, you have been a serial entrepreneur, uh, a very successful serial entrepreneur, and, and that put you in a position to be a part of Shark Tank and, and own the Dallas Mavericks. As I understand it, this is something that you started very early in life. What, what gave you the bug to, to be engaged in business activity at, at such a young age? Necessity. Um, my parents were always very specific that if you want something, you're going to have to earn it, even at the age of 10, 11, 12 years old. You know, I remember going to my dad and, and wanting a new pair of basketball shoes. And I remember vividly because he was playing poker with his buddies. And, you know, and I walked in to try to get some of the donuts. And I'm like, Dad, can I get a new pair of sneakers? And he's like, Mark, you see those shoes on your feet that work really, really well. When you have a job, you can buy whatever you want. I'm like, dad, I'm 12. How am I going to get a job? And one of his buddies popped up, probably had too many beers knowing those guys and said, hey, you know what? I got a job for you. I've got the, all these garbage boxes of garbage bags. Why don't you go around the neighborhood and sell them? And I'm like, sure. And so I went and probably had the world's first and only door to door garbage bag sales route. Used it to, you know, sell a hundred garbage bags for six bucks. They cost me three, got my shoes and learned that I could sell and that being an entrepreneur wasn't a bad job. So one of the, the key skills in being a successful entrepreneur is, is your ability to sell. So is that something that just came naturally to you or did you, did you kind of figure out how, how can I be really good at, at selling either my ideas or my products? I never looked at it really as convincing. I think what, what's really helped me is that I learned from selling garbage bags. And, and since then, that selling isn't about convincing. You know, you always hear people talk about selling ice to Eskimos, right? And that's not really sales. Um, selling is understanding your customer and realizing what their needs are and helping to fulfill those needs. I mean, if I walk up to the door and go, hey, Bill, I'm your next door neighbor. Do you use garbage bags? Wouldn't your life be easier if I just dropped them off at your house every week for only $6? You know, when you learn to do that young and you realize that if you put yourself in the shoes of your potential customer and you help save them time and effort and make their lives a little uh, more productive, maybe a little bit more profitable, you're going to be successful every time. So, uh, so understanding the, the needs of your customers and, and you know, getting, getting to that sweet spot is, is clearly critical element of success. What, what other things have you realized over the course of your many successful endeavors um, that make you such a great entrepreneur? Learning, 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 learning. I realized early on, um, you, particularly with technology, you know, I, the, what I told myself is that there were the people who invented any given particular technology, and then there's everybody else. And once this invention was released, 
I was tied with everybody else. And from that point on, it was only a question of how hard I was willing to work to learn what was going on. And, you know, back then it was local area networks and distributed databases and, you know, um, wide area networks with my first company, Micro Solutions. And then it was streaming. You know, how do you start the streaming, you know, internet broadcasting business? And now you look at things like cryptocurrency, you know, what's blockchain, what's a smart contract, what different you know, what's L1, L2, L3, L4, all these things are, you know, not necessarily brand new, but they're evolving. And if I put in the time, you know, I can learn it as well as anybody. And, you know, really, I think the other underpinning to that was recognizing that knowledge and technology and in other industries is like a little ball of yarn, right? When you first have your first piece of yarn rolling it initially, there's not much there and it's hard to get there. But once you create that ball of yarn, just rolling one more piece of yarn and making it bigger and bigger and bigger it gets easier and easier and easier because you have that base. And so what's really worked for me is just continuously learning everything and anything that I can related to technology, whether it's you know, like I said, blockchain and smart contracts and teaching myself solidity or taking um, tutorials on building neural networks and machine learning, you know, it, it takes some time, but the, the rewards are incredible. So part, uh, part of what can hold some people back is fear. And you, you seem to be fearless. Is that an act or have you, have you learned to really manage fear in a, in a sensible way so that you don't do foolish things, but you don't avoid the opportunities that are in front of you? No, I mean, I, I get as, uh, I'm as afraid as every, everybody else, but I tried to stick to the things that I've put time into and that I know. You know, I try not to go too far afield. You're not going to see me investing in things that I don't have any clue about or, or that I'm not going to have a fundamental understanding or can't get there very quickly. And so, you know, it's almost like the basketball adage practice till you can't get it wrong. And so by really investing time and, and having done the same things over and over and over again, but just extending it like that ball of yarn into new industries and new applications, I think that's really helped me mitigate the fear because if I walk in and I know I'm prepared, then you're thinking more about what you do and then rather than what you can't do. So uh, with that said, you, you have experienced setbacks in your life. Uh, I think you've been fired multiple times. Yep. Uh, you've, you've walked away uh, yep. very successfully, I might add. Uh, any regrets about the times you were fired? Any, any lessons? Because that can be, that can be a really uh, shattering event for someone. Yeah, not for me. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. I learned so much about what not to do, how not to manage, how, you know, um, how important certain things are. I mean, I, I worked for a company, your business software that fired me because they wanted me to open up the store, the retail was a software store, um, rather than go close the deal. And I remember having conversations with the, the owner slash CEO and my cover, the majority of the conversations, he wanted me to dress better. You know, my suits were two for $99. They were, they were polyester and they stood up in the corner on their own. My, my, my polos were fake and and the first, um, the first dress shirts I ever bought were all used from a place called Retreads. And he didn't like that. He, he didn't think it was becoming a, of, a, of the salespeople that he wanted. Only he would never go out in sales. And so I learned, you know, it's not how you look. It's, it's what you can do. It's not um, what, how, you just have to go out there and do the work. And if people do the work, you know, maybe they're rough around the edges. You can work on that side a lot easier than you can work on people who just aren't motivated to do the work. So uh, in addition to this point about uh, you're, you're not selling things that you're really trying to understand what, what customers want, do you, do you have some kind of special ability to sense market trends? I mean, is that, is that something that, that you feel that because you're so deeply steeped in a market that you, you have a sense of where things are going? Yeah, I mean, Steve Jobs said it best. He said everything's a remix. You know, and that's so absolutely true. If you look at the early days of Apple, they copied so much of what Xerox and Xerox Park did and Bell Labs did. And then they just extended it a little bit in a way that they thought that his, he thought that his customers would want it. And that's really the way I look at things. You know, if I look at existing technologies and I say, okay, what applications can take place that aren't being done now? 
whether it was, you know, when we started, after I got fired um, and started Micro Solutions, we were one of the first local area networking um, integrators. Now, that may not seem like a big step today, but back when PCs were brand new and people, you know, had to be convinced to buy a PC, let alone connect multiple together, that was a big deal. You know, in 95, we started a company called AudioNet because the internet seemed really interesting, but nobody was doing multimedia on it, except in some university labs. And I was like, you know what? At some point, as bad bandwidth um, increases and expands, people are going to want to use, you know, media, um, bits or bits. They don't care what they are. And, you know, now it seems just natural that people stream. But back then, people told me I was an idiot. What do you mean I'm going to use the internet, you know, to, to get audio and video? I'll just turn on the TV or radio, you moron. I mean, I can't tell you how often I heard that. You know, in, in early 2000s, um, when everybody had analog TVs, I was like, you know, let's start a TV network that's only high definition. Why? Because I looked at the flat screens, the plasma screens that were on all things, $5, and said they're just going to follow the same price performance curve as um, traditional technology. And again, I would go to these TV networks and I'm like, you moron, you know, these things are $25,000. I'm like, no, you don't understand. They're going to go down in price. No, they won't. Maybe they go down to 15 grand. And now, you, you know, fast forward to today. When you look at things like smart contracts on blockchains um, like Ethereum, and you start thinking about applications, particularly with um, decentralization and um, distributed organizations, DAOs, they're going to change how we do business. It's going to be just as impactful as what we saw with the internet 25, 20 to 25 years ago. You know, there's, there's applications now that are driven by smart contracts that automatically read the weather from the National Weather Service so that I can buy insurance that says, if the temperature in Dallas falls below zero degrees and precipitation is over three inches, this is the premium I'm willing to pay and here's the reward I want. And all that's automated with zero human in intervention. Those types of applications, could you imagine if there was a decentralized approval for or validation of health insurance claims rather than what we have to go through now? So this whole application of trustless, meaning you don't trust one centralized organization to make decisions is going to completely turn upside down traditional applications. And so just like Mark Andreessen 10 years ago, yeah, said software is going to eat the world. Now you're going to see distributed applications like blockchain um, eat software. And so those types of things and recognizing those types of trends, if you pay attention to the, the business side of things and the technology side of things, you can see how you can remix them like Steve Jobs mentioned. So uh, one, one thing that seems pretty clear is that um, as, you, as you remix and, and see the future potential of these things and, and the ideas are just flowing out here, uh, you, are not, uh, you are not disturbed or distracted from your purpose if people call you an idiot. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's, some, there, there's some level of, of self-confidence uh, that keeps you no. from, from, you know, being obsessed with all the, the doubts that, that come from others. Bill, when you hear it enough times, you learn to ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so coming back to uh, one of the things that, that, that was such a su success for you, which is this streaming, uh, streaming audio. Uh, and did that come out of your, your kind of personal interest in sports and wanting to yeah. be able to to hear different games and so on? Yeah, absolutely, Bill. Um, so my one of my best friends from um, Dallas, who also went to Indiana with me, uh, Todd Wagner and I would get together every now and then back in the mid 90s. And he was like, you know, Mark, Mark, you're the tech geek. There's this new thing called the internet. There's gotta be a way that we can listen to Indiana basketball in Dallas um, by using this internet thing. And because back then, what we would do to listen to a game was we would get somebody in Bloomington, Indiana, to put a speakerphone next to a radio. And then we would have a speakerphone in Dallas and about a six or 12 pack of beer. And we'd sit there yucking it up, listening to the games um, before there were, you know, all these TV networks. And I was like, you know what, let, let me see if I can pull that off. And, and so I bought a PC, put it in the second bedroom of my house you know, downloaded everything, taught myself what I needed to learn and, and just started going in, you know, turned into a company called AudioNet, which then turned into broadcast.com, which, you know, when we sold to Yahoo, you know, 20 years ago was YouTube and Pandora and, 
you know, you name it, all wrapped into one. So, uh, so that that sale to to Yahoo uh, after after that sale, you put a collar on your Yahoo stock, uh, which, which means you. Uh, you, you didn't get any upside that might occur, but you protected yourself against the downside. That decision has gone down as one of uh, the ten best trades in history. How, how did you how did you come to the conclusion that there might be a tech bubble, and that you were protecting yourself against such a bubble? Well, after I sold my first company, Micro Solutions, um, it took me a little bit, but um, my my broker at Goldman Sachs at the time had me talking to a bunch of analysts there and what i learned very quickly is whatever i said to them then i saw on cnbc they were parroting me and the stocks would move and so he finally convinced me to start trading stocks and and i did and i did really really well started a hedge fund sold the hedge fund because um of my returns were were killing it and then we started audio uh, audio net and then when we sold because i traded those stocks i'd seen hot areas come and go you know, PC stocks up and down, software stocks up and down, networking stocks up and down. And I'm like, look, I am the luckiest guy in the world. I got this B next to my name. How much money do I need? I've seen this story before. Let's protect my interest. You know, I just want to make sure that I have that B next to my name forevermore. Um, so I hedged and there were people again telling me I was crazy. I remember going on CNBC and, and one of the guys there saying, don't you feel foolish that, you know, Yahoo has gone up another $150 per share or whatever it is. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm just fine. You know, life is good. I'm not complaining. And then boom, everything cratered. So uh, with, with that decision where, where you were so successfully hedged, um, it, it put you in the position to, uh, to become the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. And so let, let's talk a little bit of basketball. Sure. So, uh, so first of all, uh, most of us probably like to speak our minds, uh, but we don't often have to put a price on, you know, how valuable that is to us. Uh, in your case, I think you've accumulated more than $3 million in fines uh, speaking out uh, about refereeing in particular. And so my question is, worth $3 million? Every cent of it every cent of it now that's over 20 years and and now there's a duke alum adam silver who you know has got control of those purse strings but yeah you know all those years you know i just talked about putting yourself in the shoes of the business you're trying to sell to and that's what i've been doing at the nba for 20 years now and you know there's i used to say nba nothing but attorneys and we've evolved over time and i think uh a lot of that has to do with the fact that I, I've been very vocal and that's led to a lot of changes, but not always the changes I'd like with, with the officiating group. That's, let's just say that um, I keep on pushing for changes and I, I still haven't gotten all that, I, all that we need to, to get the results that I think we can achieve. So um, this year I've kind of backed off because everybody's in a difficult set of circumstances, but next year I'll be back on that trail. Yeah. So the, I mean, there's one very you know, practical reason for speaking out, which is to drive reform and change. I wonder, is it also the case that you feel like by speaking out uh, that the team feels like you have their back and that you're, you're, willing to, you're, you're willing to speak out because you care so deeply about them? Yes, no. I mean, sometimes it can be counterproductive. I'm not going to lie. You know, um, you know, refs have feelings too. And and, you know, it's just strange. You know, everybody's got that time, those things that make them mad, right? I'm calm, cool, and collected for, you know, 22 hours of every day that there's not a game. Those two hours when there's a game, I'm insane when it comes to officiating. And even when I played, not at a high level, but the levels that I played at, I never got mad at the refs or anything, but put me at an NBA game with my team and, and all that changes. So I don't know necessarily it's about my team thinking they have my back as much as I really think that there's a need for significant reform to this absolute second that still needs to take place. Yeah. So you you mentioned to me uh, in previous conversation that you are super competitive. Uh, and so uh, I, I assume that, that part of what the Dallas Mavericks provides is a is a venue for competition where you can keep score and, and you know exactly where you stand. Now, of course, 
you brought uh, a championship to the Mavericks. And so given how competitive you are, how long until the next championship arrives? You know, the crazy thing, Bill, is that the Mavs is where I'm the least competitive because I have the least amount of impact. You know, as much as I want those shots to go through, there's nothing that I can change, you know. Um, now, during the summer, obviously, when you deal with free agency and trades and all that, you know, there, I obviously can contribute. But, you know, I, the, the Mavs actually are more – because the only there's only one winner every season and everybody else walks off the court a loser um, – that's it's more frustrating so it's not necessarily a great competitive outlet but it's certainly something that's incredibly competitive but i would tell you that you know business is the ultimate sport and that's really where my competitive juices fly um you know because not only you know for all the reasons we talked about earlier learning is important but there's always somebody out there trying to kick your ass there's some 18 year old duke freshman who thinks they have a better idea who says you know what Cuban maybe maybe have this company in this space, but he doesn't get A, B, or C. So I'm just going to crush his ass. And, you know, that keeps me motivated. And, and that's the, the competitive side of me that I really enjoy. Yeah. So uh, speaking of a slightly older Duke alum, uh, you did bring J.J. Redick uh, onto the Mavs. And my yep. question is, has he forgiven you yet for, uh, you know, the detour to Dallas when, when he had... No. Nah. <laughs> JJ and I get along great. Yeah, that was, the, yeah, that, JJ, I mean, he's a great dude. We just went out, um, him and Tommy and I went out and had some coffee um, the other day. He's fun to talk to. He's really into business and stuff. And, you know, basketball is his job and he's got a ton of outside interest. So, yeah, JJ, JJ and I get along great. Um, and he's really helped us. Um, he was out last night. Hopefully he'll be back tonight, but he's a great dude. Yeah. So, uh, so, Back to the, the world of business and, and what seems to be a trait of yours that, that carries across different domains, which is you, you're a reformer and you're, you're passionate about having things done the right way, uh, whether it's refereeing or, say, the SEC. Right. Uh, and so you, you ran into uh, a, uh, a, a dispute with the SEC, I think back in 2008, you came out on top yep. in that dispute, yep. but you are still, you, you are still going, you know, after this question of how do we reform the SEC appropriately? Tell, tell us about that. Yeah. I mean, long story short, they decided that, um, they were investigating, investigating a company that I bought and sold shares of stock in. And kind of in a quid pro quo, that company said that I did something wrong. And the SEC let that company off the hook for, for their deeds. And that company, as it turns out, um, was kind of run behind the scenes by a noted crook, a guy named um, Cott. And just so happens that Mr. Cott, um, if you ever saw the movie Wolf of Wall Street, the guy who stuffed all the stocks that... Um, that had to be sold, um, he was that guy. And so this whole thing was crooked from top to bottom, but they decided that I was the big, the SEC decided I was the big fish that they wanted to go after. And it took me, you know, five years, went from when the, um, they came after me with the civil litigation to a trial that took maybe three hours, that the jury deliberated three hours to find me not liable. And from that, I learned a lot. And one of the things that I learned and why I'm still, you know, passionate about it is there are no real laws regarding insider trading. You know, all there are are legal precedents. And rather than trying to summarize those and clarify them and create white, um, bright line um, guidelines that they can post on a website, the SEC prefers to regulate through litigation. And regulation through litigation is no way to run a government agency because the only goal is to keep lawyers employed and to effectively entrap people. And that's unfortunate. And they have no interest. Maybe Gary Gensler, the new guy who just got approved, um, will change things. But they really have had no reason. There's been there's been nobody to push them to change. And so every chance I get to throw them up against the wall and say, why do you not write right line right, um, guidelines? And I'll give you the, the simplest example. Um, 
if you wanted to know more about whether or not you can make a trade, whether or not an action is allowed or not, you would think that you should be able to at least go to a website. Maybe there'll be a chat bot. Maybe there'll be a phone number. So I decided to do that and I recorded it and put it on, uh, on YouTube. And I just called up the SEC and said, I had a question. And I said, this is Mark Cuban. I've had some issues with the SEC. So I want you to know. And I went round and round and they were, they were cordial and everything. And they finally sent me to a page on their website that said, here's how you get your question answered. And this was a couple of years ago. And they said, you have to fax to them eight copies of a page with your question on it. And maybe they'll get back to you. That is our tax dollars at work. That is the agency that's regulating the entire financial industry in this country. It is just ridiculous. And all it really is, is a job employment program for lawyers who want to be in finance. They work at the SEC, then they go into private practice and, and typically make a lot more money, a lot of money, because they know that the SEC is just going to keep on suing people for dumb, idiotic things. And I can give you a long list of stupid things they've sued people for, but I won't bore you. So following, following on this theme of talking about financial markets, they, they seem to be evolving in interesting ways. And you, you've been uh, uh, outspoken on this topic and, and the idea that uh, some decentralization of, uh, of power in these financial markets is evidenced by the GameStop situation. So where, where do you think we're headed there? I think we're headed to trustless. If you think about our financials, financial institutions, whether it's you know brokerages, banks, um, insurance companies, they're all built on trust. The biggest buildings in every decent size or larger city are banking buildings. You know, and when you go to take a loan, whether you go to deposit money, even when you you know when to set up an account to deposit money, you have to go through a series of people. Even online, there, you've got to go through a series of approvals, and the more the, the bigger the financial impact, the high, the more people you have to go through to get approvals. You know, I've got a big bank account. I'm, I'm not a lie, right? And, I'm, and I'm, I'm blessed to have it. And I still have to get multiple people signing off on things just to borrow or lend money with them. And with trustless institutions built on blockchain, you know, um, DEX is the, is the, the slang word for them. You can, you can be your own bank. If I have one Bitcoin or if I have, you know, one Ethereum or, you know, $10,000 in Ethereum or other cryptocurrencies, I can loan people money and make a whole lot more interest than I do in a savings account. I can borrow money, you know, over collateralized. So it might take 10,000 in Ethereum to borrow $5,000, but I can do that all without getting any approvals. It's all automated and takes about three minutes in total to do. And it is so much better. And the returns are so far greater than traditional banking that it's going to change the game. And those applications can be extended into business processes like we just talked about. And you're seeing that a lot with NFTs. You know, what got me excited about NFTs, not just that it's a hot area, but I, I wanted to learn. So I went to sell something and I saw this little fill in the blank that said royalties. And for the first time, you can take any IP you own, sell it as an NFT. And every time it's resold, own, earn um, a royalty on it, 1%, 15%, 30%, 50%. And the applications there are endless from music to art, the collectibles market we've seen. But imagine if um, there were cliff notes that were done as an NFT. And so you bought an NFT for your cliff notes for your class. You spent your $19 or whatever online. You opened it, unlocked the NFT when you bought it. And when you're done with it, you're over with the class, you go back to that marketplace and sell it again. And the originator gets to keep on earning royalties on each one of those transactions. Those are how things are becoming trustless or decentralized and how the game will change. Imagine if you could do that with textbooks. You know, now the publishers play all kinds of games because they don't make royalties on secondary sales. If they went and put um, their textbooks digitally now and put them as NFTs with smart contracts with royalties, they would earn royalties and the price of textbooks would drop significantly, but the publisher's earnings wouldn't fall at all. And it wouldn't shock me if at some point, because those industries are so staid, 
that people start buying those publishers just to be able to change the game. And so that type of trustless or decentralized applications built on smart contracts on top of blockchains is, are just game changing. And we're just now starting to see the applications. So um, uh, let, let me shift from all, all of the entrepreneurial activity uh, that, that's possible in that space to your, your job, which is kind of the being a public entrepreneur uh, and your participation on Shark Tank. So uh, are, you, are you on Shark Tank because uh, it's just fun or are you doing it because it's really a public service and you're trying to encourage entrepreneurship in society? I mean, it, you know, explain to us what, what you think you get out of that platform. I mean, Shark Tank Friday nights on ABC at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Saturday, Shark Tank? That um, be, yeah, it could, could be that one. <laughs> okay. No, I just want to clarify that it, it is on Friday nights on ABC at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, but actually both. Um, I do it because it sends the message to kids and entrepreneurs of all ages that if somebody from a small town, town in Idaho or North Carolina can find their way onto the carpet to pitch the sharks than anybody can. And I can't tell you how many times that, you know, during normal times or even now via email where parents or kids will email me and say, you know, I've been watching Shark Tank and I've started this business or that business. Um, how do I get on Shark Tank or do you have any tips for me? And just the idea that we're encouraging entrepreneurship, that we're sending the message that the American dream is alive and well is more than enough to get me excited to do the show every year. And what, what's been your, your best investment and your most fun uh, choice uh, from Shark Tank? Um, actually, it's, it's been a normal distribution, maybe a little bit better than normal distribution. About 20% of the 150, give or take, companies that I've invested in have done really, really well. About 10, 15% of, of sucked apples and the rest are in the middle grinding along, some doing fairly well. But I've had a couple, actually I've had a lot of exits, but my biggest exit was a company, Cycloramic, which was interesting because they came on Shark Tank as an application that allowed you to do panoramic pictures in an iPhone 5. So this was a few years ago because the bottom of an iPhone 5 was flat. Then when they changed the, the file, the, the format, um, the, the structure of the iPhone, um, we had to pivot and we got into computer vision and now that they've been purchased by Carvana and the stock price of Carvana has gone up from like $18 when we sold it to $275, give or take. And so that's turned into an enormous deal for, for all of us. But it's just a great example of a company that came on that had to pivot that their business really was software rather than one app. And now, if you go to Carvana, you know, you can turn the car around and open the doors all on the website or in the app. And that's their technology. So uh, I, I'm going to shift from Shark Tank to what's happening in society and what may be happening in, in some of your domains. So uh, uh, let, let's start with, in 2018, there were very public allegations uh, about sexual harassment within the Mavericks organization. So walk us through what, you know, how, how you address this, what, what you learned from it, and you know, how you could make your culture better in this space. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously a horrible time for us. I had a CEO that had been in place for 15 years and you know, let them run the organization. And I focused on the basketball side, not really you know, getting involved on the business side because the business basically, I thought, ran itself. But as it turned out, we had he was not a, a good actor. He had done some things that um, where he had harassed women and and I didn't see it. And there's some things that I didn't handle correctly. And, and so, you know, it, I had made I made significant mistakes. I took my eye off the ball. And, and so I brought in a woman, um, Sint Marshall, who really came in and revitalized the culture. Um, you know, she she was good at, at managing people and at taking a business forward in, in ways that I was not. And she she got us turned around and we went from just having to deal with some horrific trauma with people in the organization to to really 
revitalizing everything, getting those people the help they needed, but also, you know, learning and and really getting a strong leader in there that that may put culture first. So when when you were discussing this uh, with your your fellow sharks, uh, you, you said a couple things that that I'd like you to to elaborate on. One is you said. Uh, treating people equally does not mean treating them the same. What what did you mean by that? That's actually a quote I got from a book by a woman named Joan Williams. And effectively, you know, I always thought that equality was a math equation. If I said something stupid to a white male, I could say something the same exact line to a white woman or black woman or Asian woman. And that was treating everybody equally. And that's not the right approach. The, the right approach is that we're all different. And treating people equally means giving them equal opportunity and giving them equal access to things that they might otherwise not have, have had access to. And it was, a, it was a hard lesson for me, but it was harder, it's been harder for, for those populations to deal with it. And so, you know, now for me, treating people equally means treating them individually and trying to understand who they are, what their goals are, and putting them in a position to succeed or, or enabling people that, that work for me, manage them, do the same thing. And, you know, I, from a business perspective, what the way we were doing it was bad business. And, you know, because I, I also learned that by learning more about individuals and who they are, those people have unique skill sets that allow them to go into their communities that I might not understand. You know, as worldly as I like to think I am sometimes, you know, there are a lot of communities I'm not connected to and won't be connected to. And if I really, you know, or our organizations, all my companies, all my portfolio companies pay attention to the backgrounds of the people we hire or may be able to hire, that opens up doors to new markets that we may be more effective in or never reached before. I mean, at the Mavs, as an example, you know, even though the CEO we had problems with was African American, um, we we weren't reaching into communities with the people from those communities. You know, we we had guys who looked like me trying to sell to Latinx or to Indian communities, and that that was not doing it the right way. And now we've changed dramatically where we try to get people in those communities. And really, as an investor, that's opened up doors. That, that perspective has opened up doors for me as well, because now looking at people I invest in and seeing the communities they have access to and realizing those communities are underinvested in. And because they're underinvested in, even though there's strong buying power there, there's a lot of incredible opportunities that have opened that have that led to great investments for me. And so, um, and, and really developing smart entrepreneurs that otherwise I, I might've missed. And so, you know, it, it was a tough time, but I learned a lot. And, you know, as you said, um, treating people equally is, is never about treating them the same. So another, another thing you said, uh, which you've really alluded to in those comments, is I, I really didn't open the door to considering other people's perspectives, which, which you now do. So how, how did you get the epiphany that, wow, I, I really need to open myself up to get these other perspectives? I, I listen better. You know, as an entrepreneur, um, I have that arrogance, you know, that I know, you know, Hey, I can come, I can look at any company and I can find a way to help them, like we talked about earlier. But at the same time, you know, that precluded me from seeing all the opportunities, you know, that there were things that I missed. And by listening better, um, really opened up a lot of doors. And really the pandemic, as horrific as it's been, really led to being a better listener because everybody went has been going through that same fear and that pain and that agony uh, and uncertainty and anxiety. Um, and you, I've really tried to make an effort to, you know, listen to everybody um, that I can speak to um, because they're closer. People, people make close bonds and friendships in business. And it's often the people that are doing the, the most day-to-day work that not, you know, that traditionally you wouldn't think of as being strategic, right? But they're, they're doing the, they're dotting the I's and crossing the T's. They develop the strongest relationships with your customers and talking to them and, and being authentic and listening to them has allowed us 
allowed me to to really um, do a better job as, as an entrepreneur and serve our customers better um, during the pandemic. And that's led you know, to me to having a better understanding with all these things we just talked about being trustless. You know, the top-down organizations are not going to be as effective long-term as bottom-up decentralized organizations. And I think, you know, a lot of these technologies we, we just discussed are going to um, speed up that change. So uh, shifting, shifting gears yet again, uh, we are clearly living in highly polarized times. Uh, we, we frequently see political gridlock. Uh, and we've seen this interesting phenomenon that uh, given, given the world of politics may not be as functional as we would like it, that we see businesses and the business of sports weighing in on societal issues. How, how do you feel about this evolving role of, of business in terms of addressing social issues and you know, issues that might have previously been considered beyond the scope of a, a business or, or a sports league? You know, it's amazing that when you listen, you learn. And for all the reasons I just mentioned, you know, Gen Z, as you see, kids coming into Duke today are different than they were 10 years ago, even. And, and, you know, Gen Z and millennials are significantly different, particularly older millennials. And they're different than Gen X and they're different than boomers. And everybody's got a different perspective. Um, but the younger generations want us to be authentic. They want us to be involved. And they're, that's the leadership that we're developing. Those are the people I'm investing in. Those are the people who are going to be guiding the world. And I think the NBA, myself and others have, have realized that, that, you know, it's not my generation that we have to, to worry about. Oh, actually, we need to worry about my generation, but it's not my generation that's going to be running the world in 20 years, right? It's my kids and it's the kids in Duke right now. And I think some businesses, including the NBA, including myself, have learned from the pandemic that when you listen and particularly listen to younger generations, they, they want us involved. They want that authenticity, you know, because they don't trust centralized companies. Their centralized companies are, you know, are very introverted, if you will, right? They're looking at their own goals, their own needs. And that's not what's going to help this world. That's not what's going to save the planet. That's not what's going to make us, you know, um, bring generations to get, bring people together, bring the world together. And, and so I think this activity, we've learned to accept the fact that boomers, people my age, Gen X, people my age, are, are going to disparage that effort. But at the same time, the future of the world depends on those people who are supporting it. And I think that's why it's important. So you, you don't seem to be a, a big fan of uh, our, our current politicians. Right. Uh, so tell me, what, what are they missing? And, uh, and will we see Mark Cuban enter into the political arena because of what is missing at this point? So I'll answer the second question first. No, you're not going to see me as a candidate for anything. Um, that's just not going to happen. But in terms of the problem, in, in my opinion, the underpinning is that everything's focused on two parties. You have two parties that pick candidates. We don't get the best candidates. We get the most expedient candidates for those parties. And you know, maybe two parties served our interest in the past. But in this day and age of technology and the ability to, to make the world smaller and the country much smaller, um, for better or worse, I think, you know, parties have outlived their usefulness. There really is no value to a political party. You know, they raise their money online. They choose their candidates in, you know, old school ways. And they also support, you know, minimizing the access of candidates. I, I support um, a organization called the Center for Competitive Democracy. And their whole mission is to get independent candidates and third party candidates on ballots. And the incumbent two big parties do everything possible to keep those candidates off the ballots. And, you know, so I also support ranked choice voting because the way our system works right now is that because we're a primary based system for the two major parties, and the fact that so few people vote in primaries and those people who do vote in primaries are typically at the greatest extremes in, in terms of viewpoints, 
the politicians have to pander to those extreme extremists because those are the ones who vote and give money for primaries. And, you know, that's not the way it should work. You know, either get rid of the primaries, get bring in ranked choice voting, extend or simplify the access to candidates, or, and I know this is not going to happen anytime soon, let's just get rid of political parties because they serve no, no purpose. And to me, again, one of the most patriotic things you can do is if you belong to a political party, give up your membership. Just vote based off of what you think is right rather than, you know, doing what's in the best interest of a party. So, Mark, uh, sadly, we've, we've come to the end of the time for uh, our, our Q&A, but uh, within, the, within the Duke community, we, we reserve the, the highest accolade for leadership uh, for people that we believe are leaders of consequence. You have earned that accolade multiple times over with your many, many endeavors, and we thank you for caring so deeply about society um, and trying to elevate uh, others around you and elevate the, the world we live in to reach a, a greater potential. So many, many thanks for joining us. It's been absolutely a pleasure and a privilege. Thank Great question. Thank you. Thank you for the challenge. And I really enjoyed it. And thank you to everybody at Duke. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you at events throughout the rest of the week. If you have any questions, uh, please do go to the reunion's website, and uh, we look forward to seeing many of you again later in the week. Thank you.